Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Conan the Unknown. I can't believe it's taken us so long to get to this one, but it's did Hitler go off to Argentina after the war and uh, live his best life? I mean, no he didn't, his best life was, was his Fuhrer, right? But no he didn't, he killed himself, which is nice. <laughs> Uh, I agree. I agree. I agree with you. It's the best thing he ever did, to be honest. Um, welcome to the show. If you're new here, what happens? One of my writers, in this case, Arnaldo. Thank you, Arnaldo. Has written me a script. Never read this before. Not really sure where this conspiracy got. Well, I know this conspiracy, like a lot of Nazis did, you know, bugger off to Argentina and live their best lives. But Hitler wasn't one of them. And today, I assume we're going to debunk that. Or Arnaldo's going to discover something that is going to blow some wide open and it turns out that Hitler did go out to Argentina which doesn't seem likely but it's always possible so keep watching or listening to the end and let's jump in did I say the format of the show is I've never read this before I think I did I'm gonna react to it let's go you don't need to be a long time aficionado of decoding the unknown to know that all the best conspiracy theories involve one or more of the following ingredients. Aliens. Yeah, always. Every time. Aliens, aliens, aliens. It's like, it wouldn't be a decoding the unknown. You could literally do a decoding the unknown about anything. You know, Vatican secret archives. Whatever. Just pulling that out of the air. It'd be like, well, some say that they've got proof of aliens. And it's like, boom. There you go. History Channel show right now. Bet made. It's already in pre-production. Ancient yet technologically advanced civilizations, of course. Think of Atlantis, yes. One secret society or the other. Well, the Vatican secret. I guess it's not a secret society, but there's probably a group of. There's definitely a conspiracy theory out there about there being a secret society protecting the Vatican secret archives and stuff like that. Of course, there are. And of course, a certain political party which seized control of a certain European nation in 1933. Theories containing these elements are so pervasive, invasive, and widespread as to become a part of the very fabric of modern popular culture culture. We have all heard somehow that something fishy goes on in the Bermuda Triangle, something more than a balloon fell over Roswell, and that there is no way the pyramids were erected by a massive workforce of well-paid and skilled laborers. Yeah, that would be impossible. How could that be possible for people in the past to be skilled, especially people from Africa? This is the thing, like... <laughs> I bring it up a lot, but it's just something that really crystallized my mind when I first heard it. And it's like, yeah, they're like ancient aliens building the pyramids. These just vaguely racist because <laughs> it's like it's Europeans being like, oh, ancient Africans gonna do that? It's impossible. <laughs> they wouldn't have the skills. My brilliant fellow writers at this glorious channel have thoroughly eviscerated and decoded the intrinsically fragile buffoonery of those theories. But there is another conspiratorial notion which seems to have been doing the round since the end of World War II, cropping up at regular intervals to inspire journalistic inquiries, non-fiction books, as well as works of fiction. Well, even those non-fiction books are technically works of fiction, aren't they, Arnaldo? Because that Hitler didn't go to Argentina. To say nothing of the multi-season professionally produced documents documentaries on the History Channel. I mean, they are professionally produced and they are multi-season. I don't know if Arnaldo's being sarcastic, but they are professional. It's the History Channel. It looks slick. Does that mean that there's any history in there? I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of history, but there's also a lot of making shit up, allegedly. So yes, works of fiction. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Arnaldo and I, same page. What I'm talking about is the possibility that the leader of the aforementioned party... Oh no, I see what Arnaldo's trying. He's trying to keep me safe on YouTube, but I'm pretty sure I mentioned the N-word. Not that N-word, the, the, the N-A-Z-I N-word um, in the beginning, which probably already got me demonetized, which is a bit rubbish if I did. Oh no. Oh, hell no. <laughs> Uh, oh, now that he's so smart. <laughs> so he said, it's me. I'm the one who bears the consequence of this. Dem I'm the one who's like, I'll do it. I'll pay for it. I'll upload it. And then it's like, YouTube's like, mm, no, not today. And it's like, oh, for God's sake, please. It was very expensive to make and very time consuming. Not that I'm not having a fun time, but it's like, I also like to, to you know, get paid because this is my job. It's not a hobby. <laughs> You're going to give me my money? sort of a hobby. It's not really. It's a hobby I get paid for and I have to go to work for. It is fun though. Sorry, enough rambling. Let's go on. Instead, he managed to flee to Argentina alongside his wife, Eva, where he conducted a peaceful retirement until his death in 1962. By now, the YouTube spy algorithm should have dozed off, so I'll spell it out for you. Is there a realistic chance that Adolf Hitler and his missus, Eva Braun, escaped by escaped capture by the Allies in 1945, fleeing to Argentina? 
Dear Simon, I apologize for jumping to confusion so early, but this theory has been widely debunked by accredited, well-respected historians. I hope that doesn't come as a surprise. It definitely doesn't. Didn't they even find his skull at some point? Wasn't it like afterwards? The Soviets took his 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 skull and then kept it in a box somewhere. And then they later DNA tested it. It was like, yeah, it's hit the skull. Boom. Case closed. Did that happen? Or am I making that up? Is that from a movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. So in this episode, I'll take a different angle. Rather than restating what happened, what appears to be the obvious, at least to me, we're going to explore how the rumors of an Argentine Hitler first originated and how some of these may have been mistaken as plausible, thus explaining the popularity of this conspiracy. And I'll kick off with an entree of stalin's porkies to untangle the complex web of rumors alleged reports of purported sightings of the best known austrian export since the croissant wait a minute wait what isn't a croissant french born as a keep furl in austria in the 13th century this pastry officially became the croissant when how do you sp how do you pronounce croissant like officially it's croissant 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 today i wanted to eat a croissant. croissant so i went to a place that sells croissant and i bought i saw a gordon ramsay video talking about croissants right and i was like oh my god i've been pronouncing it croissant my whole life and Gordon Ramsay's like, uh, what you do is you take the croissant. And I'm like, oh, okay, Gordon, you would know. Being a chef and all, uh, when the Aust an Austrian artillery officer opened a bakery in Paris in 1839. Well, there you go. But let's proceed in chronological order. Today, the events of Hitler's last days are common knowledge. Who would have thought you'd tune into a Decoding the Unknown episode about Hitler f off to Argentina and you'd learn about the origin of the croissant? You're welcome, viewer or listener. You're welcome. On the night of April the 29th, 1945, the Fuhrer married his longtime lover, Eva Braun. On April the 30th, as the Red Army approached his bunker under the Reich Chancellery, the newlyweds committed suicide. A Hitler shot himself in the head while Braun swallowed a dose of cyanide. As per the dictator's commands, their bodies were carried into adjoining garden and set on fire. In the last days of the war, <laughs> Jesus, is that really what you'd want done to you? It's like, yeah, just take me out into the garden once and kill myself and set me on fire. I'd be like, look, I, I'd like to be cremated. I mean, I'd like to have my body frozen, to be honest, which I should go about arranging. But, like, just being set on fire in the garden? <laughs> Holy sh**, is that really gonna burn? You're just gonna end up as, like, a charred mess from, like, a horror movie. You're not gonna be fully burned. It's just gonna, like, burn your skin off. And then you're just gonna look like some sort of monster. That's not how I'd cheat. I'd just be like, oh, I don't know. Just bury me? But then they're gonna dig you up and they're gonna drag your body through the streets and spit in your dead face, aren't they? Okay, take me into the garden and burn me. Ah, good answer. In the last days of the war in Europe and immediately afterwards, however, these facts were not yet known. The uncertainty around Hitler's fate sparked a whirlwind, a whirlwind of speculation and misinformation from the very start. On June the 6th, 1945, Soviet officers from the staff of Marshal Zhukov informed the British press that Hitler's body had been found and a post-mortem found the cause of death to be poison. But on the same day, Stalin himself informed Harry Hopkins, US Secretary of Commerce, that Hitler was still alive. Stalin, why would you do that? Why would you make up this pointless lie? I mean, I guess it's not pointless. It's Stalin. He was probably playing chess. Like, what's he thinking of? Three days later, Marshal Zhukov announced that the dictator's body had not been found and he could have indeed escaped. Then at the Potsdam conference in July, Stalin first expressed the theory that Hitler could have escaped to Spain or Argentina. Stalin started this shit. Stalin, you got enough bad marks on your report card, Stalin. You had to do this as well, didn't you? Also, Stalin murdered loads of people, started a conspiracy theory. Stalin's such a this was just a passing reference as on later occasions the Soviets alleged that Hitler may be hiding in Germany in the British occupation zone. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. These allegations put severely to the test Anglo-Soviet relations. On one hand, British intelligence services and the Foreign Office did not believe those claims. On the other hand, they were reluctant to dismiss them outright so as not to taint their relationship with Stalin, who was still considered an ally. <laughs> so the Foreign Office is like, bro, we don't have Hitler. It's like, have you seen Hitler, mate? And they're like, no, I haven't seen him. And then like, oh, for f sake. Hey, Stalin. Yeah, no, no, maybe. <laughs> maybe we have him. Who knows? We're still friends, right, mate? Yay! <laughs> According to a 2016 study by Luke Daly Groves at the University of Leeds, quote, no documentary evidence has been produced to explain why the Soviets repeatedly stated that Hitler was alive despite possessing large quantities of evidence to the contrary. 
There are several theories as to why Stalin decided to broadcast this porky. By claiming that Hitler was alive, he could strengthen his claims on German territories occupied by the British. Or maybe he did so to undermine the credibility of Marshal Zhukov, whom he considered a potential rival. Oh, oh, Zhukov, be careful. You don't want to be a rival of Stalin. Do you know how many people in the military he killed? There was that great purge. It was a lot, <laughs> Zhukov. Be careful. If, if I was working with Stalin, I'd be like, you're the boss, Stalin? I have no intentions of ever becoming the boss at all, ever. And I genuinely wouldn't, because I like being alive more than being the boss. Love you, Stalin. You're the best. And then I would flee. I'd flee. I'd definitely flee, I think. I'd like to flee. It's probably a bit rough working with Stalin. Alternatively, by stating that Hitler was hiding in Spain and Argentina, he could attack those right-wing authoritarian regimes. Another possible explanation is that Stalin wanted to preserve the threat of a resurgent Nazi organization to maintain the wartime alliance. Finally, it's likely that the Soviets were not happy with their own investigations on Hitler's death and wanted to keep Western scrutiny at bay. It seems like it could be all of the above, to be honest. The confusion as to the whereabouts of Herr Hitler, created by his mustachioed rival, was compounded by the mysterious appearance of German submarines in Argentina an event which immediately set ablaze the imagination of speculative journalists and their readers. So it's time to fill our bellies with an order of German subs. Argentinian reporters and writers up to recent times have written about those mysterious subs, wondering what their significance was. So let's consider the best documented submarine landings and sightings. On July the 10th, 1945, the U-boat U-530 showed up at the port city of Mar de Plata, some 415 kilometers south of the capital of Buenos Aires. The captain, 24-year-old Otto Vermouth, 24 years old and the captain of a U-boat. Wow! Holy crap, I'm watching this TV show where uh, I just started watching it. Oh god, what's it called? It's on Netflix. It's really good. Treason! It's called Treason. It's a British show. And it's like this guy gets promoted to be the head of MI6 and he looks like younger than me. And I'm like, oh my god. It's like, <laughs> that would be a lot of responsibility that I don't feel I could deal with very well. I mean, obviously, I haven't had a career as a spy, so it's not like I've been preparing for it. But I just don't feel like old enough to do that. I can understand. Only Americans say that you can't be president until you're 40 or something. And I think that's a really good rule because, I don't know, I don't feel capable. I don't have enough experience to do that. And it's like, wait, how's this like 30-something-year-old, the head of MI6? And it turns, well, I won't spoil the TV show, but there's a reason. And it's really compelling. It's a really good show. Treason on Netflix. Not sponsored. Should be sponsored. Come on, Netflix. Give me some money. You can pay me whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be that much. Uh, so this dude surrendering, the young captain surrendering to Argentinian authorities. Now we should clarify that Argentina's ruler, President Farrell, had remained neutral in World War I, sorry, World War II, until March 1945, before siding with the Allies and declaring war on the Axis. Talk about last minute. <laughs> He's like, wait, wait, which side's gonna win? Which side's- okay, the Allies, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I've been with you all along, love you Allies, mwah! <laughs> Great job. For added context, for Alps Perel's protege, Vice President and Minister of War, was an admirer of both Hitler and Mussolini and would, have elect and would be elected president on June the 4th, 1946. His name was Juan Perón, husband of the equally famous Evita Perón. But let's return to Captain Wormuth. The presence of the young officer and his even younger crew. Jesus, is my. <laughs> <laughs> all of them younger than 24 and aroused the curiosity of the locals including journalists looking for the scoop of their lives a reporter in buenos aires claimed to have seen a police report stating that a lone submarine had emerged off the southern coast of the country dropping up a high-ranking officer and a civilian the reporter conducted that they may have been adolf hitler and eva braun dressed as a man this piece of investigative reporting was quoted by argentinian news outlet info bay in april 2019 in their piece writers also raised the point that it was very strange for a german sub to suddenly pop up off the coast of south america what were they doing there what was their secret nefarious purpose why wouldn't captain vermouth reveal any details as to why he had led his crew to mar de plata had they transported Mr. and Mrs. H and or other Nazi officials? More mysteries would follow. According to a Navy report, an unknown submarine was sighted on the evening of July the 24th off the coast of Clara Merco, 270 uh, kilometers southwest of Mar de Plata. On the night of July the 27th, 
The police station in Canadon de la Piedra Negra, more than a thousand kilometers further south, reported submarine activity in the area. An unidentified vessel had been issuing light signals towards the land, prompting a patrol to investigate the coastline. The officer seized a German citizen who confessed that he was expecting visitors from the sea. Some 15 kilometers from the area, another police patrol found traces that a large package had been dragged along the sound. This is all very uh, the sand. This is all very suspicious, isn't it? The 24th and 27th of July sightings have never been fully explained, but we'll take an educated guess and speculate that they may have been related to the next event in our timeline, the confirmed appearance of a second German U-boat on August the 17th, again at Mar de Plata. Vessel U-977 was commanded by 27-year-old Captain Hans Schaefer. Like his colleague Vermouth, he stubbornly declined to answer any questions about the reason for his presence in Argentina. Or at least, that's the version reported by Infobay. Okay, so I get the feeling this is the point where it's like, and that is where, <laughs> and that's the end of it. It's like, it's going to be, yeah, they mostly misreported and just got things wrong. But let's find out. In reality, there wasn't anything untoward about a vessel of the Kriegsmarine rocking up at South American port to say hi or heil, followed by a polite I surrender. Probably not best to be like heil, I surrender, just to be like whatever the opposite of heil is. Just be like, surrender? <laughs> Just waving a white flag around? The first major naval battle of World War II, the Battle of River Plate, ended just like that. German pocket battleship Graf Spee traded blows with Commonwealth ships in the South Southern Atlantic before repairing in Montevideo, Uruguay, and eventually scuttling itself. Scuttling itself, sorry, not extra in there. Scuttling. Scuttling sounds better, though, doesn't it? Scuttling. Scuttling? Scuttling. Scuttling. Blah, blah, blah. This is an epic story, by the way, which Simon covered in his most bellicose channel, Aura Graphics. Indeed, I did. I hear the scriptwriter for that episode is extremely learned, as well as radiantly handsome. <laughs> is that you, Ardaldo? Did you write that script? I don't remember. It probably is, isn't it? Anyhow, it was part of the Kriegsmarines overall. Is it? It's Kriegsmariner, isn't it? Kriegsmariner or Kriegsmariner? But it's uh, uh, it's very hard not to say a Kriegsmarine. It's part of their overall strategy to perform commerce raiding operations in the Southern Atlantic to disrupt Allied trade. Captains Vermouth and Schaefer, therefore, would have been fairly acquainted with these routes. Moreover, contrary to what was published by Info Bay, the two captains were questioned by Allied and Argentinian authorities and had no problems in explaining why they had decided to surrender at Mar del Plata. Captain Schaefer, in particular, revealed that he and his crew were concerned about claims issued by German propaganda, according to which the Anglo-American occupation troops intended to enslave and sterilize all German males. <laughs> Propaganda's intense. If the Germans won the war, if the, sorry, the Nazis had won the war, that would have been the, like, the narrative, right? That they were invade, they were going to take over and sterilize everybody, so we had to fight them. Crazy how propaganda works, isn't it? On the other hand, the captain knew that Argentina had joined the Allied side at the last moment. Moreover, the country boasted a large community of German origin, hence the U-boat sailors hoped to receive better treatment on that side of the Atlantic compared to their homelands. Yeah, fair enough. I totally get it. That's extremely reasonable. Given the choice between living as a castrated slave or enjoying prime steak after a session of tango, I would have done the same, so I'm inclined to argue that Schaefer's reasoning made perfect sense. The matter was sealed by the Argentine Naval Ministry. Their official communique confirmed that the German subs did not carry high-ranking Nazi leaders, nor had landed any mysterious passengers before surrendering. What a surprise. Yet they were already there. It's like they were already doing that patrolling and stuff and sinking shipping boats and all of that, you know, stuff. One suspicion lingered on, however, that U-530 and U-977 were part of a larger fleet of at least four submarines, so where had the other two subs gone? I mean, were they even there in the first place? It's just a rumor. Maybe there were subs with them, maybe there weren't. Is there any proof for it? Let's find out. Years later, in 1957, pilot Mario Chironi was flying over a small bay called Calita de los Loros, some 800 kilometers southwest of Mar de Plata. During a period of extremely low tides, the aviator spotted what looked like the outline of two sunken submarines resting in shallow waters. In 1980, an amateur fisherman spotted the wrecks of two vessels in the area from a distance of about 100 meters. Wait, people spotted this and no one was like, let's investigate. They were just like, cool. Yeah, okay, whatever. Moving on. I got fishing to do. Okay, bye. The sightings were only investigated in August 1997. You waited 40 years. Why? 
When the government of President Carlos Menem launched naval operation Calypso to scope out the Caleta de los Loros, the results of the mission remained classified for years, fueling the fire of speculation. Were there actually two German submarines resting on the bottom of the bay? And what was their cargo? In 2010, Defense Minister Nilda Gare eventually disclosed the contents of the Calypso report. The oblong outline spotted by the pilot in 1957 turned out to be iron-rich deposits which had accumulated off the coast over the years. Is. Okay. So it's just, it's just iron. It's just natural resources. Which makes for an underwhelming conclusion to the saga of the German subs. Or does it? Parts of the Argentinian Navy files related to the sightings taking place in 1945 and the following decades remain classified to this day. Yeah, but we went out and looked at them. It's not like they took those subs away and replaced them. I mean, a conspiracy theory is like, well, they replaced them with iron ore deposits, didn't they? But to explain it, it's like, okay, guys, chill. So as we wait with bated breath, let's look into another source of alleged Hitler sightings in Argentina, the FBI archives. Trolling Hoover In 2014, the FBI declassified a stash of 700 pages worth of documents related to reports and investigations about alleged sightings of Hitler in Argentina. The release was warmly welcomed by conspiracy theorists. If the Bureau and its dictator, J. Edgar Hoover, had taken a serious interest in looking for the Fuhrer in the mid-1940s, surely the theory had some weight. Yeah, I, I personally find like declassified files really interesting it's interesting to see like what the government was up to back in the day i thought it was so interesting that i considered starting a youtube channel called declassified where like when the government or any government or like there was a freedom of information request and like something interesting came out to like cover it on this channel and then i was like looking into it and i was like yeah most of it's just really boring and you have to sift through so much stuff to find anything interesting and then you discover something interesting and it's really not that interesting because when the government de declassifies something they're not going to declassify something that's like holy sh oh my god and when they do you hear about it in the regular news so i didn't end up doing that channel i really still like the idea though it's a cool channel name it's a i think it's a good concept but just it i don't know it didn't work out for whatever reason you got any ideas to make that like a bit more spicy in the comments let me know and i'll do that so it's time to have some fun and review some excerpts from the FBI archive. The first report is dated September the 21st, 1945. A special agent in the Los Angeles Bureau reported that a journalist at the Los Angeles Examiner had been contacted with a story by an informant whose name had been redacted. Let's call him The Dude. The Dude had spoken with a friend whose name has also been removed, so we'll call him Walter. Walter had told The Dude after his encounter with a third character, an, an Argentinian immigrant who we'll call Donny. <laughs> Is Donny like a typical Argentinian name? <laughs> so is that Don? <laughs> <laughs> and here's what Donny had told Walter. Donny was okay, so we've got Donny telling Walter telling the dude. Okay, we're already getting like really far from the source here. Donny was one of four men who had witnessed the arrival of Hitler in Argentina two in Argentina two and a half weeks after the fall of Berlin. So in mid to late May 1945, the dictator had disembarked from a U-boat moored at the Gulf of St. Matthias, accompanied by two women, one doctor, and a number of Nazi officials. According to Donny, the Fuhrer suffered from asthma and ulcers and had shaved his signature moustache. Hitler and his companions were welcomed by six Argentinian officials who had driven them to a ranch nearby where he was supposedly still in hiding. The journalist at the Los Angeles Examiner published the story as reported by the dude and later tried to contact Donny the Argentine. According to the dude, Donny regularly ate his meals at the Melody Lane restaurant and so the reporter stalked the establishment to locate his source but to no avail. Get the feeling his source might not be real. The FBI took the dude's story quite seriously. Really? So if some journalist publishes something that he heard from a dude who heard from a... Who was the middle guy? Walter? Who heard from Donnie? And then the FBI investigates. FBI, don't you have other shit to do? <laughs> Aren't you busy? Did you have a li like light caseload or something? Uh, and they checked immigration records for Argentine citizens entering the country after May 1945, but could not find a match for Donny. The special agent's report concludes by saying that because of the lack of sufficient information to support the story, it is believed impossible to continue efforts to locate Hitler with the sparse information obtained to date. Now, this entire story of Donny speaking to Walter, speaking to the dude, speaking to the journo sounds like, well, a lot of kerfuffle with no substantiation whatsoever. Yeah, I already pointed that out. It's like third-hand information. I mean, interestingly, by the time you're hearing it, it's information from Donny, who spoke to Walter, who spoke the, to the dude, who the journo wrote down, who Arnaldo then reported on, and then I read. 
So it's quite a distance from the original story, isn't it? It's, it, it, it's going to be Chinese whispered. But out of curiosity, I checked the location of the Gulf St. Matthias, where Hitler had supposedly landed. To the north of the Gulf, the sea protrudes inland, caught carving a small bay called Caleta de los Loros. I hope you've been following because. <laughs> oh god, I haven't. <laughs> because that's the location where the fay aviator first spotted the two sunken subs in 1957. Oh, there you go. Thanks for reminding me on that, because I definitely wouldn't be able. There was a, when it's foreign names, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like. You know, Delos something. In a Delos there, in a Delos the this. Blah, blah, blah. Those subs were later described as actually being iron deposits, but I'll also remind you that the official report from the Argentinian Navy has not been fully declassified yet. <laughs> They're like, turns out it's iron deposits, and then redacted. And then under the redacted bit, it's like, actually, that's a lie. We'll assume this bit's going to be redacted. It was submarines, boys! They were full of gold and paintings! Please note, my esteemed Simon and listeners, that I am not jumping to conclusions. I only wanted to point out how disparate rumors and unrelated facts can be easily joined up together by conspiratorial minds, hence lending a veil of credibility to the theories that we are discussing today. Moving on to other findings in the FBI archives, it appears that J. Edgar Hoover directly received mail from any Tom, Dick, and Harry claiming to know about Hitler's whereabouts. On October the 24th, 1945, the director received a handwritten letter which was a real gem, and it reads, Dear Sir, I'd better to a donut that Hitler is located right in New York City. There is no city in the world where he could be so easily absorbed. No doubt you have considered this possibility, but I mention it for what it's worth anyway. Really, this has been preserved by history. Some random dude sending a. This is like the ins like the amount of insane messages I get just from insane people. Just that you know, they end up in the spam box or in the real email inbox or in like the Twitter DMs or Instagram DMs. It's like holy. Uh, but the, the idea that these would be preserved for posterity and then make it into a podcast episode about Hitler going to Argentina and it's just so pointless is absurd. Like, why did you hold on to this? And it's not like this is the digital times. This is like that letter's probably stored in a warehouse somewhere. A giant warehouse full of apparently infinite files. Another sender claimed that Hitler was hiding in Switzerland. The proof the dictator could never be asked to learn any other language than German and the Swiss had, quote, played ball all the time during the war with the Nazi Reich. On November the 3rd, 1945, someone claiming to be a full-blooded American exhorted Hoover not to believe the lie that Hitler was dead. He knew for certain that Hitler was living in an underground compound some 725 kilometers northwest of Buenos Aires alongside two body doubles. The entrance of the compound was guarded by two concealed walls operated by photoelectric cells, allowing the traffic of incoming cars. Surprisingly, Hoover sent polite replies to all of those letters, acknowledging the receipt and inviting the sender to contact the bureau should they come across further information. Did he really? Surely that that's just a generic stock reply like no thanks or please stop emailing me or remove me from your mailing list needless to say the fbi archives do not show any record that the special agents followed up on any of these tip-offs <laughs> they're probably like he was at it again isn't he and why does he keep forwarding these stupid letters to us this one's written by a full-blooded american it's my humble opinion that these centers were just having a plain good old time spamming and trolling hoover by then an already controversial figure the almighty director the director, however, did receive some credible information. Back on October the 22nd, Hoover received a clipping from Magazine Digest discussing the possibility that a much alive Adolf was hiding in Argentina. Four days later, Hoover forwarded the clipping to his contacts in Buenos Aires and Montevideo, Uruguay. The director wrote that this is transmitted primarily for your information. However, he suggested for his agents to interview another individual in Uruguay, the man who had apparently made the original claims contained in the article. The guy's name was obscured, so we'll just call him Juan. On November the 28th, Hoover got a reply from the Office of Legal Attorney at the American Embassy in Montevideo. This reply clarified that the article clipped from Magazine Digest had originally been published by the Chicago Times. This paper employed the services of Juan as a local correspondent, and Juan had heard from a relative in Argentina the now trite story that Hitler was still alive and chilling in Argentina. It's always a friend of a friend, isn't it? The legal attorney in Montevideo proceeded to dump on Juan, describing him as, quote, a local representative of low cal Caliber. His reputation is extremely poor, and he is generally considered to be a journalist of the most sensational and unreliable nature. So he's just, he makes up, basically. 
which led the Office of the Legal Attorney to dismiss the need for any further inquiries. The Montevideo memo contains another interesting tidbit of information. The author of the letter states that, quote, the possibility that Hitler and Eva Braun were in Argentina was reported to the Bureau in the Buenos Aires office on July the 19th, 1945. As mentioned earlier, the earliest file in the FBI archive dates back to September 1945, hence this July report, mentioned here only in passing, has either not been archived or not yet released to the public. In any case, I find it interesting to note that July the 19th, 1945, is only nine days after the arrival of sub U-530 at Mar del Plata. I'm only speculating here, but this may support the idea that following Stalin's porkies, it was the German subs which mostly contributed to the Argentine Hitler conspiracy. But let's take a look at another batch of interesting documents. So far, we trawled through memos and letters submitted by le alleged trolls, friends of a friend of a friend who had been seen something, or just unreliable journalists. So let's take a look at reports from people who may have actually known what they were doing. On October the 23rd, 1945, an interesting memo landed on Hoover's desk. The sender was not a potential troll, but someone rather more credible. The Strategic Services Unit, or SSU, an offshoot of the Office of Strategic Services, itself a precursor to the CIA. The memo concerned one Mrs. Eichhorn. She is the owner of a large spa called Hotel Eden in La Falda, Argentina. Eichhorn boasted about being a financial supporter of the Nazis from an early stage. More precisely, even before the Nazi party was found, that she made available to Goebbels her entire bank account to be used for propaganda purposes. Okay, why are you writing this to the CIA? Like, hi CIA. <laughs> I gave money, lo I gave loads of money to the Nazis who lost. Why are you doing this? Huh? Why not? She and her family had later developed a friendly relationship with Hitler, so much so that when they visited Germany, they stayed at the same hotel as the Fuhrer. Mrs. Eichhorn had recently declared that, quote, if Hitler should at any time get into difficulty, he would find safe retreat at a hotel where they had made the necessary preparations. On November the 13th, Hoover forwarded the SSU report to an undisclosed recipient at the American Embassy in Buenos Aires, specifying that it was for informational purposes only. The Eichhorns and their Hotel Eden in La Falda have become an integral part of the Argentinian Hitler mythos. And while it is true that it was frequented by numerous German clientele, there is no proof that the spa was visited by any high-ranking Nazi official, let alone Hitler. Moreover, following Argentina's declaration of war against the Axis, the property was confiscated by the government for several months. And if I might chip in my own two cents here, it sounds to me like Mrs. Eichhorn may have exaggerated her importance as a valued supporter of the Nazi regime. But why would you do this afterwards? Why would this? <laughs> it's like during the Nazi be like, yeah, it was up me and Hitler are big time mates after the war ends. No, I didn't know him at all. <laughs> I met him once. We had, we, I, I saw him in a coffee shop. That's it. As reported by the SSU, she had stated that a bank account had been made available to Goebbels for propaganda, bu propaganda purposes even before the Nazi Party was founded, which makes no logical sense. The Nazi Party was founded in January 1919, so does this mean that Eichhorn poured funds into Goebbels' pockets in December 1918? That was when Goebbels was a 21-year-old university student, still years away from becoming the party's propaganda orchestrator. Was Eichhorn a Nazi time traveler from the future with minute knowledge of interest rates on bank deposits through the 20s and 30s, who was therefore preemptively funding the rise of the regime? Yes, that's it, she was a time traveler. Conspiracy established. That's worth at least one sci-fi short story, but let's keep our feet grounded on plain old boring documents, shall we? In June 1947, an FBI agent compiled a lengthy account collected from a French informant, a journalist who happened to be a former member of the resistance during the war. Whilst traveling on business in South America, the informant reached the Brazilian seaside town of Casino in early March. Whilst there, he attended a lively dinner dance evening at a local hotel, attended by several patrons of German descent. After noticing a young girl performing a Nazi salute, he recognized one of the attendees as Weissmann, a former officer with the German occupation force in Paris. Then, sitting at a table, he cited a couple which he he believed to be Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. The French journalist came to the conclusion that the entire town of Casino was a community of former Nazis in hiding. He spoke to the hotel manager, asking if he could take some photos to write a travel guide. The manager vehemently forbade him from taking any pictures and asked him to leave within the hour. The FBI agent, compiling the report, concluded that the sighting was not worth investigating further and even added a comment suspecting that the French informant may have been a communist agent. Okay then. In September of 1947, the FBI office in San Diego, California, received a memo from a trusted informant, in which he stated having received a handwritten letter penned by Hitler himself. 
The informant claimed having personally met the dictator in the early 1930s, which explains why they'd remained pen pal. The Fuhrer wrote that the idea of him committing suicide in Berlin was laughable. At the time of his alleged death, in fact, Eber and he were already flying to Argentina to be welcomed by their good friend Juan Perón. The FBI office in San Diego examined the letter and found some irregularities with the postage used. You gotta get it right. If you're gonna fake a letter, it's to the FBI. It's important. They're gonna look into it. And they're gonna be like, oh, that's not a real stamp. Or whatever. You gotta make it perfect. Come on now. Eventually, the informant admitted that it perpetrated a hoax for the sole purpose of creating a sensation and was submitted to psychiatric analysis. <laughs> ah! Uh, oh, no, he's a trusted source as well, wasn't he? And it's like, were you lying? He's like, yeah. Why? I was bored. Oh, for God's sake. Off to Broadmoor. Or whatever American Broadmoor is. Bellevue? A cottage industry. I feel that if we continue to review these alleged sightings, we too maybe need to submit it for psychiatric analysis. But the abundance of reports, often coming from or reviewed by reputable sources and institutions, clearly had an impact on the collective psyche of conspiracists worldwide. In reality, it didn't help in dispelling this persistent myth. In 1947, hunter of Nazi war criminal Simon Weissenthal learned about the existence of a secret organization called Odessa, which helped former SS officers escape Allied capture. These wanted criminals would cross the border with Switzerland, proceed into Italy, and find refuge in the Monastery Route, a network of religious institutions which provided asylum to the refugees. Ah, the church. Good times. From Italy, the Archbishop of Genoa, Giuseppe Siri, and former fascist officers helped the Nazis to Argentina and other South American countries where they could count on the support of large German communities and sometimes a sympathetic government official or two. Yeah, I mean, that's why this conspiracy holds, like, you know, more water than it should. It's because, yeah, some Nazis did escape to South America. What was the famous one? Who they went hunting and they captured? And then they, the Israelis, Mossad, they captured and executed? What was that guy's name? Hmm. Was it, it wasn't Mengele, was it? Someone they captured and then they executed him. And it's like, yeah, okay. So obviously there, there were Nazis hiding in South America. It's just Hitler wasn't one of them because he shot himself, finally. On some occasions, Allied military secret services contributed to these daring escape plans, envisioning an upcoming confrontation with the Soviets. Organizations such as the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps wanted to preserve the safety of German officers considered as experts in fighting the Red Army. They were also experts in losing against the Red Army, but that consideration may have been lost on them. After Odessa ceased activities in 1952, it was replaced by the Comrade Workshop dedicated to keeping hidden and providing funding to ex-Nazis already on the lam. Dessa was not the only organization devoted to this purpose. Another little-known outfit was one called Hack, created by Hitler's personal secretary, Martin Bormann. With the help of such organizations, infamous SS officers such as Otto Skorzeny, Joseph Mengele, Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann is the guy. Eichmann's the guy who they hunted down in Argentina or whatever and then took back to Israel in a box and killed good. <laughs> Uh, he resurfaced in Spain, Argentina, and Brazil. With notable exceptions, such as Eichmann, many of them evaded capture and died of natural causes, which is a great shame. This collection of theories and established facts fueled a cottage industry of books and documentaries dedicated to the Argentinian residence of Adolf Hitler until his alleged death in 1962. One of the most prolific order authors is Argentinian writer Abel Basti, who has written nine books on the topic. Sounds like Abel Basti, in my opinion, likes writing these books to make some money, doesn't he? Quote only his latest 2019 work broke. Just one book is enough. The Second Life of Hitler, Basti collected the testimony of two eyewitnesses of note. One of them is Mrs. Eloisa Lusion, employed at the San Ramon farm in San Carlos de Bariloche, close to the Chilean border. Lujan claimed that this was Hitler's last hideout, whom he reached by train. Her job at the farm was to taste the dictator's meals before they were served to him to prevent death by poisoning. Oh, please. Could you come up with a more ridiculous thing? And I know that happened, but it's the sort of thing you'd make up if you were making something up, isn't it? The other testimony comes from an unnamed retired Argentinian officer. In 2017, at the age of 91, the retired officer underwent a delicate surgical intervention. Before the operation, fearing impending death, he called for his wife and told her, I'm going to die, so I'm going to tell you a story that's the biggest secret of my life. 
For the record, the officer survived, and as of 2019, was still alive and well, but here is his story. In September of 1953, President Juan Perón summoned his war minister, General Cerro. The president needed the services of an officer with a German surname for a very delicate task. Lucero complied, and the following morning, Perón welcomed into his office the protagonist of the story, back then a young lieutenant. Perón and Lucero demanded that the officer maintain absolute secrecy about the mission they were going to entrust to him until his death. When the lieutenant swore not to spill any beans, Lucero very plainly blurted out, You have to take this briefcase to Adolf Hitler. You have to go to Bariloche. You have to leave immediately. The briefcase was handcuffed to the lieutenant's wrist, and off he went. Again, this sounds like the sort of story you'd make up if you were making up a story, doesn't it? Even with the bloody briefcase and the, the handcuffs on it. After traveling by plane and jeep, our friend reached San Ramon. There he met Adolf Hitler himself. The meeting was very brief. The Fuhrer warmly greeted the officer, collected the briefcase, and bade him farewell. That's extremely unlikely. If he's in hiding or whatever, there's no way that it'd introduce a new face to him. Especially such an unnecessary face. It would be just a guard out front would get the briefcase. Or he'd just leave it in a park and he'd go pick it up later wearing a disguise. Like he's not just gonna be like, Oh, hello there, old bean! Yes, it's me, Hitler! Just in case, you know? Because obviously, if he was still alive, he would be the most wanted man in the world. Possibly ever? Basti's books are replete with such accounts, interspersed with factual, corroborated information concerning the establishment of German economic concerns in Argentina during the war, as well as other well-known stories about Nazi escapees. In 2011, authors Gerhard Williams and Simon Dunstan used Basti's research as a springboard for their own conspiracist book, Grey Wolf, The Escape of Adolf Hitler, later, di later adapted into a documentary with a 5.5 rating on IMDb which isn't very good. The book was outright dismissed by mainstream historians as little more than hokum, and the authors were even accused of plagiarism by Basti. In later years, the inevitable History Channel bestowed upon our screens the multi-season Hunting Hitler running from 2015 to 2022. You spun it out into five seasons, History Channel! This episode's gonna be less than an hour! How do you do it, History Channel? Which, surprised, which scored a surprising 7.3! This is not a rating on historical accuracy or methodological soundness mind you but it appears it was at least entertaining and professionally produced yeah of course it was it's the history channel is gonna be entertaining but don't think what they're showing you is actual history despite their name they should just rename the channel stop lying <laughs> allegedly in my opinion i was not willing to sacrifice hundreds of hours of my life to watch this documentary so i'll just quote from the review published on variety you got a review in variety hunting hitler becomes just another silly reality show with a crack team of investigators that almost instantly flits off to argentina chasing down leads that in the first hour add up to a whole lot of nothing in fact if viewers were to take a shot of alcohol every time someone uses a phrase like there could have been or there's a chance that hitler might have come here or if there was in fact a bunker they would be plastered by the second or third commercial break well said variety that's an entertaining and probably bang on review the truth but look i can get plastered on my own thank you very much but in these circumstances i'd rather stick to sobriety and reassure you simon and dear listeners that i'm absolute certainty that adolf hitler and eva braun died in berlin on april the 30th 1945 and how do we know in November of 1945, following the artillery barrage of Stalin's bullcrap, British counterintelligence officer Dick White decided to settle the matter once and for all. He ordered historian Hugh Trevor Roper to investigate the last days of Hitler, a thorough inquiry that resulted in a book called, well, The Last Days of Hitler. Yeah, it's the uncreative title that would expect to be attached to an actual work of non-fiction. Trevor Roper traced down several officials who had been close to Hitler in the Fuhrer bunker and would describe to him what we now know as the official version of events. These included Hitler's personal aides, Heinz Linge and Otto Gunsch, who took care of burning his and Braun's corpses. Then in 1956, a Bavarian court carried out a similar investigation in order to issue a death certificate for the Führer. No surprise here, it reached the same conclusions as Trevor Roper. Moving on, in 1965, wartime Russian interpreter Ellen Rzhevskaya published her memoirs. She described how, after the fall of Berlin, she worked with Smirsch, one of Stalin's secret services. Her team collected Hitler's charred remains from the Chancery Garden, tracked down the dictator's dentist, and compared his jawbone to the dental records, and it was a perfect match. So look, he got burned up in the garden, didn't he? Fans of Casual Criminalist may argue that eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, but don't worry, because we have actual forensic evidence. The dental stuff is forensic evidence, right? 
That seems pretty bang on. It's not like he faked his mouth. I mean, I guess people can do that nowadays, but it's going to be complicated. You're going to have to get someone's mouth. And you, or it could just be some. No, it's got to be his records. Someone would have to remove Hitler's mouth, put it in another person's mouth, and then the burn that person in the garden. And then Hitler's going to be walking around without a mouth. Which isn't going to be brilliant, is it? In August 2018, a team of French biomedical scientists published their study, The Remains of Adolf Hitler, A Biomedical Analysis and Definitive Identification. Again, that sounds very much like a sensible work of non-fiction, or maybe just an academic journal. Study. There we go. Professor Charlier and his researchers gained access to Hitler's jawbone held in the archives of the Russian secret services. They then compared the remains with dental records, thus being able to identify the Führer by his false teeth, which were 25 out of 30, by the way. Oh my lord. Charlier's study also found the five remaining teeth, real teeth, showed no traces of meat, a finding comparable, compatible with Hitler's vegetarian diet. Can't we? Some of Hitler's relatives are still alive, right? There were cousins and such things. I think they were in America and they changed their name and they decided not to have kids, which is intense. You're just his cousin. Well, I'm sure there's probably kids in your family and you're like, well, yeah, but they're not me. So that's, I mean, interesting but can't they get a sample of their hair or whatever and then compare it to the dna in this jawbone and be like yep hitler why then with such convincing accounts and evidence of hitler's death by suicide do so many people believe that he survived a further 17 years in argentina the uncertainty around hitler's death in the last days of the war created an informational void which was quickly filled by speculations issued by an apparently reliable service i.e the soviet government while the allies conducted their inquiries only at the end of 1945. the key month seems to be july 1945 that's when stalin first made passing reference to an argentinian hideout which may have been amplified by the appearance of U-530 on July the 10th, followed by the other unconfirmed U-boat sightings. That's when the notion started to take root, appearing in the Argentinian press and somehow making its way to the FBI. The conspiratorial stories then made it to the American press in September 1945, and the Marstrom just kept on spinning from there. Yeah, that's just it's just how conspiracy theories start. This is what happens. There's a little kernel of something that is then later disproven, but that kernel is already planted and then it grows into nine books in the History Channel documentary series that ran for five seasons. At subsequent intervals, the Argentinian Hitler theory was fertilized further by the intricate tangle of verified facts, learned guesses, and wild speculation founded on dubious testimony. In the 1950s, we had the sightings at Calata de los Loros. In the 1960s, Eichmann was apprehended in Argentina. Otto Skorzeny himself, the fearsome Scarface commando, revealed that he had trained Peron's bodyguard. In the 1970s, Mengele died in Brazil after having resided in Argentina in the 80s and 90s, Abel Basti published his series of books. In the 2010s, the declassification of FBI files lent some questionable legitimacy to the conspiratorial flames. But there is a deeper question. Why do so many people want to believe? Better minds than mine have pondered this very question, one of them being Richard Evans, Professor Emeritus of History at Cambridge and a fellow of the British Academy. That's a very like long title of saying he's a very smart dude who's real good at history. <laughs> he, he's the Professor Emeritus of History at one of the world's best universities and a fellow of the British Academy. Richard Evans is a true big brain. So let's see what he's got to say on it, rather than the crazy dude who wrote nine books called Hunting Hitler or whatever. No one gives a shit. He's prob they probably made he's probably made that whoever made that series and wrote those books has probably made more money than Richard Evans, which is depressing, isn't it? Or maybe not. Maybe Richard Evans used his big brain to also make some money, which would be awesome. I like you, Richard. I know nothing about you other than the fact that you're spending your time debunking this nonsense. When speaking about conspiracy theories in general, he said, For conspiracy theorists, the accepted version of history isn't reality. The official version can be disregarded because it was propaganda designed to fool people. When addressing Hitler specifically, Evans remarked, long quote here, Surely a political genius of Hitler's stature must have hoodwinked the Allies and proved once more his superiority to ordinary mortals. In some cases, the proponents of Hitler's survival have strong links to the neo-Nazi scene or are involved with white supremacy organizations in the US. For others, Hitler is an evil being whose survival is the result of work by malign forces within the deep state. Hitler is a universally recognized figure, so any sensational alleged discoveries about him are bound to attract worldwide attention as the news media's gullible or exploitative or cynical press reactions to reports of his survival have demonstrated. So some fringe groups purveying various forms of alternative knowledge, such as occultists or UFO enthusiasts, seem to think that associating their beliefs with Hitler will gain them attention. 
Those who believe or purport to believe in it can boost their own self-esteem by assuring themselves that they know the truth, whereas everyone else who takes a different view is deliberately covering it up or has been hoodwinked. Yeah, it's the normal conspiracy b It's that, ah, oh, you sheep. You're just too stupid to follow along with a the conspiracy theory. Ah, 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 I'm so much better than you. Nonsense. Well said. What was your name? What's the, this legend's name? Richard. Well said, Richard. And therein lies the eternal paradox about the most persistent conspiracy theories. Yes, Arnaldo. In an effort not to be hoodwinked by the official narratives based on serious research, we're happy to feed our imagination or confirm pre-established agendas by allowing ourselves to be hoodwinked by the most fanciful and sometimes dangerous stories. Bang on! Arnaldo, you're also a big brain. Thank you, you as well, dear listener, dear viewer. You are also the biggest of brain. And you know what the big brains do? They leave me a, leave me a review for this podcast wherever you listen. Or, if you're on YouTube, definitely you're smashing that like button and you're subscribing to this channel. And I'll see you next time.